Well, look, uh, thank you very much, Alan, for coming along today. An old colleague uh, while I was in Sydney until 2015 and now still uh, based in Sydney. Alan has written a recent report about strategic issues uh, more broadly in the region uh, uh, coming from China's rise. Um, and so today's discussion is really going to be around what uh, the kind of meaning of China's, uh, not just its economic rise, but its uh, military impact and its strategic impact uh, in the Asia Pacific region, but more broadly is. I guess my first question then uh, to Alan, having sort of thought about this issue for many years, is um, do you think the anxiety uh, about China is in, in public and political discourse now? Do you think it's, um, is it well placed? Is it well articulated, particularly in Australia and also in the region? Um, and if not, what should we be worried about or should we not be worried at all? Mm. Well, it's pretty clear there's a lot of anxiety in the Western democratic world about China's rise. Some of that's well founded and some of it's misplaced. Um, it won't surprise you to know that one of the problems always with trying to understand China is we have very few people who actually have had you know, recent experience of living in China. We have very few Mandarin speakers. So most of our perceptions of China are through the English speaking press and from, you know, from, from commentators who are not really China specialists. So that tends to, that, that tends to sort of, uh, you often get distortions of China uh, through those sorts of prisms. Nevertheless, having said that, there are some uh, areas of, of considerable concern to countries like Australia and the UK and, and democracies. And over the last few years, certainly since the Trump administration, we've seen a, an increase in tensions between the US across the trade and tech sectors are now, of course, becoming more geopolitical. It's gone from just a series of spats to really it's a systemic problem now. And I think it does bear comparison with the Cold War in a number of ways. You have uh, a growing rivalry between the two largest powers in the international system, the United States and China. This is not an ordinary sort of great power conflict, as I point out to a lot of my friends and colleagues. It's it's basically one between two quite different systems, political systems, and you get a lot of mutual misunderstanding when that happens. So there's clearly an ideological dimension to it. So it does just uh, draw comparison with that between the Soviet Union and the United States uh, 50, 60 years ago. It's systemic. So it's not one issue, it's across the board, across their relationship. It threatens to draw the rest of the world in. What I think we're now moving into is a period of heightened strategic tension between the US and China, which is shaping now, which is essentially affecting the whole world. And it's going to be more a sort of simmering but contained rivalry between the two in the years ahead, with always the possibility that something goes wrong, someone miscalculates, and you could get some kind of military conflict. Now, we all hope that doesn't happen. And there are some um, there are some constraints on that because the, the difference between what I say, what I call the emerging Cold War and that of the first Cold War is that China and the United States are co-dependent, if you like, economically, the way the Soviet Union and the United States never were. And that means if you're talking about decoupling the two countries, easier said than done, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, and I think the Americans are finding that, and so are the Chinese, that it costs, that they are sort of interdependent. And so I don't think you're going to see a full divorce. You're probably going to see more, the greater likelihood of some degree of separation decoupling, but it's going to be more of a managed decoupling. It's not, not going to be clear cut, but I don't think we're going to see the world divide into two hermetically sealed, rigid sort of geopolitical blocks like we did in the first Cold War. I think it's going to be a lot messier, much more fluid. But on certain issues, countries will coalesce on the China side or the US side. And the question is, on what issues and to what extent will this occur? So, so now that's the sort of the macro picture, if you like. And in my part of the world, in, in Asia, of course, um, what happens between the US and China matters more even than the rest of the world because both the Pacific powers and, as you know, the economic centre, global economic centre of power shifted decisively from the Atlantic and Europe to Asia. 
And so what happens in Asia really matters much more than it did 50, 60 years ago. And Australia is very much part of Asia and we've, we've got our own concerns here with China. So that sort of provides a bit of context really I guess just uh, before going on to the Australian um, case, I mean, um, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of the Indo-Pacific. Um, I can't remember if you mentioned it in your report, um, the Indo-Pacific, and uh, I think India has actually just mentioned it, uh, 2018, I believe, they started to also talk about the Indo-Pacific in a, I think a government paper. Before then, they had been a bit silent about it. Um, do you, I mean, so as an alternative, do you see the Indo-Pacific as being viable? Do you think that offers a kind of counterbalance or is it just fanciful? Well, look, you know, describing countries and geographies, there's always a political dimension to this. So we used to talk quite happily about Asia and then it was Asia, it was East Asia, then it was Asia, Asia, it was Asia and the Pacific, the Indo-Pacific. And why does the Indo part come in? It's coming for two reasons. Um, the first argument is that um, the broader contest between the major powers in Asia is not confined to East Asia. It's now, of course, must include India as a rise in democracy. So, to some degree, the, the rise of India has shaped perceptions that the geography of the region is broadening and, and it's becoming more connected. So, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean are becoming more connected entities. However, uh, you can take the the characterization of the region too far. Um, it becomes a bit too amorphous if you start to put South Asia in and Central Asia. I mean, you, you start to lose the focus and clarity that East Asia has or even the Asia Pacific. So and there is a political reason for using this. The Chinese hate the term Indo Pacific, of course, <laughs> because they see this as a uh, as a you know a subterfuge by the US and India as part of the containment strategy of China sending out a signal to China that, um, you know, if we're going to have a strategic contest with you, you have to remember it's not just us, the Americans, and our allies in East Asia. It, we also have the Indians on board. Of course, the Indians like it because it recognises that they're a rising power, uh, they're part of the region, so on. So you, you, have to, you have to actually decipher the politics of this. But, but I think, having said all that, the Indo-Pacific is a concept now that's broadly accepted not just in Asia, but more generally. You know, a sort of old colleague of both of ours, Hugh White, uh, I think in the mid to 2010s was writing a lot about, well, some people characterized it as almost, you know, ceding sort of space to China, saying, well, look, you know, uh, the South and East China see these areas, they're China's sort of strategic areas, so let's just sort of, you know, do a deal. Um, I mean, that's, that's a character. Sure, I suppose, of what he was saying. But, you know, it was really like that sort of pragmatic uh, management. And it seems that that is um, not uh, tenable anymore. I mean, it seems from announcements even yesterday in America, you know, pushing back against China, this is possible. Um, do you think that China has its rightful place? And how does it have a rightful place in the Asia-Pacific region? Sure. Look, I've always argued that China does have a rightful place that it is a major power, uh, it is the major Asian power by any, by any measure. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I mean, I have some sympathy for the argument. The problem is how you define that rightful position. Does that mean, therefore, that we must somehow accommodate China's interests in all things? Uh, what about the South China Sea and its occupation of those um, of those those islands there, is that justified under international law? It does mean accommodating China mean accepting that breaches of international law? Um, so, you know, it's all very well at a conceptual level to talk about these things, and, you know, I don't have any problem with that. But when you come down to the practical realities of what it means and how it's interpreted, this is where you run into problems. And I think I have to mm -hmm. say that the Chinese have not helped their cause by their pretty aggressive approach now uh, and, and quite coercive uh, policies that they've adopted over the last six to 12 months in particular. The famous wolf warrior diplomacy now, we've had a lot of exposure of that in the press. Um, 
the fact that China is putting overt pressure on countries to toe the line or to support China's interests. So it, it appears that it's adopted the strategy now we're going to use our power and our weight um, to get the outcomes we want. And if that incurs some criticism of Western democracies, we can live with that. Uh, and the other issue there is China's definition of core interests. And you, you will well know as a China specialist that that used to be confined to really only three areas, essentially domestic issues, you know. But now that sort of the notion of core interest seems to be uh, expanding all the time. So the South China Sea now has become a core interest and, and other areas as well. So there is a sense, uh, not just in among Western democracies, but even certainly, for example, in Asia, that China is really pushing the envelope and making it very difficult for other countries to accept China as an important country without ceding their sovereignty and subordinating themselves to China. I mean, where do you draw the line here? So that is the issue that's confronting most other countries in trying to come to terms with the new assertiveness of China's policies, I, which I think have been quite counterproductive in the last several months. When I think we uh, met in Sydney, uh, when I was based there, I think um, in 2014, I remember you made a comment that stayed with me that, um, you know, uh, Australia, I think, has a sort of navy of about 27,000 people. <laughs> uh, I mean, it may be kind of a bit more now, but, you know, for a vast, vast area, that is not a lot of people. And I think also uh, we were talking about the, um, you know, security pact with uh, America, the um, ANSYS Treaty, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, US Treaty, and you know, whether it was still functioning, uh, you know, kind of, is it more symbolic rather than real? And of course, Trump uh, has made many questions about that. And so on the question of Australia, I guess the thing that I really am fascinated by is, you know, um, where, where does Australia really belong in this argument? Because over the last sort of 20 years, maybe even longer, it's shifted so much. Many defence papers, you know, under rub, there was a very strong one. There's been another one recently. Uh, you know, the uh, Australia in the Asian Century paper, you know, all of this discussion. Um, do you think that's symptomatic of a kind of hardening of position now, you know, of Australia finally making its mind up about what it thinks about its role in the region and what it does with China? Or is it actually just a continuation of a long process of soul searching where it still doesn't really know what to do about being this unique place in this unique geography dealing with this unique problem? Well, look, that's a good question, and I'll answer it this way. I think there are some elements of, of our own identity and working out what our position is in, in the new world. Uh, and that has evolved quite dramatically from the time when we were alive when so great and powerful countries like, <laughs> like the UK once was and the US, all right? So for us, that was a no-brainer, um, you know? We didn't have to make any choices, so it was pretty easy for us. And the US was the dominant power after the Second World War. Pax Americana, until probably the last 10 years, was, was essentially the world was run by Americans. So for us, that was easy. And we had the benefit of hitching our wagon to China's rise, so we benefited in two ways, you know? One, through our strategic alliance with the United States, and through, through our burgeoning trade relationship uh, with China. So we, we, we sort of underlined the caricature of Australia as the lucky country, right? We have been lucky. But for the first time in our modern existence, we are facing a situation now where our major st our strategic partner and our major trading partner now are loggerheads in an intense rivalry. And how do we navigate that? And the answer is with extreme difficulty. Now that the core problem for us is this. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult for, for Australia to have it both ways. We are being forced to make some choices. This is the point that Hugh White made several years ago, having to choose between China and the US. I think that's an oversimplification, but in some areas we are having to make choices. And inevitably, we are going to come down on the side of our major strategic partner, which is also democracy, because of the shared values thing. Our values is very important. And the more coercive and assertive China becomes, the more difficult for us to, it is going to be for us to reconcile those tensions. 
And a lot of Australians, and particularly Australian elites, have been quite shocked and disappointed at China's behaviour over the last few years. I mean, there is a strong argument that we haven't really done much or changed much. It's really been us having to scramble to respond to the greater assertiveness of China. So we didn't want it to come to this point, but now we're having to take to make some hard decisions. So we have started to take them. So in a way, Australia is an exemplar uh, for all democracies particularly, but even for medium-sized countries in Asia about how you manage China. And then the way, the approach that Australia is taking is we have now stood up and drawn a few red lines in the sand and said, look, our values are paramount. Anything that infringes upon our core values, like freedom of speech, you know, um, all the, all the core values of liberal democracies, anything that impinges upon that, we are not going to accept. We are not going to subordinate our sovereignty to any country. Um, we want to have a good trading relationship with China, but not at all costs. And if the issue is forced, we will start to diversify uh, and decouple, even though it's going to cost us a lot of money, we don't want to do it. We feel we don't have much choice but to do that to some degree. Now, as I said before, it's not going to be a full divorce, but we are moving towards a significant degree of separation from China across the board, and China knows that. Uh, and if you look at the rhetoric now between Australia and China, particularly on the Chinese side, it's quite hostile. You know, we've been described now by the Global Times, okay, it's not, not the Chinese, it's not an official position, but the gum on the boot, of, on the, the shoe of China, and these sorts of, uh, you know, these epithets have been held at us in a way that's been quite shocking to Australians, you know. So that's that's where we are, I think, at the moment. I guess the sort of final couple of questions, really. One is about the context that you've just um, described. Uh, so Australia is a country that has had pretty solid economic growth for, I mean, nearly 30 years. I mean, I think the last time there was a problem, really, a recession was in 1991, I think. I was actually... Um, living in Australia then and you know kind of so so from that time you know nearly 30 years not a blip but now it looks like there's going to be you know some some issues because of COVID-19 do you think that is going to have an impact you know that at the moment the mindset in Australia is yeah we can kind of draw the lines because actually you know we, we we've always been okay economically but if there is a, a very very unpleasant recession maybe even a depression um then is that going to kind of change this attitude and make people say, well, we don't like them, but we're going to have to do more and more with China because economically that's the only viable route? Or do you still think that this is a position that Australia is going to take no matter what the economic cost? Look, there is no one Australian position, obviously. So the way I'd answer that is that um, I think the business community is still largely of the view uh, that we need China more than ever because of COVID and because of the, the economic problems that we're confronting now that are the worst since the Great Depression. And I can understand that argument from a business perspective, but business will not win this argument because it's going to be, it's essentially a political argument. Uh, and the government of the day, the Morrison government, has taken a pretty firm stance against some of the things China's been doing and have clearly made a decision that even if it costs us, even in this difficult situation now, we have committed to a course of action where we are going to separate to some degree from China. The question is, how far will we go and you know, over what period of time? And a lot of that will be determined by China, less so than by Australia. I mean, we're essentially reacting to China. It's not like we're driving this, although the Chinese may not see it that way. And I think most Australians would see it being a fairly sort of reactive position and with some degree of reluctance and disappointment that we're doing this. Because, you know, I mean, you look at the university sector, highly dependent on Chinese students, the tourism sector. Our economy is more reliant and dependent on China than any other country in the world, the possible exception of South Korea. So it's going to cost us more than it would, for example, the UK, far more. Um, but it's pretty clear that the Morrison government, I think it's supported by the opposition Labor Party on this, is really committed to a course of action where if, you know, at the end of the day, we're going to sacrifice some parts of our economic relationship for greater independence and self-reliance, and if that means 
decoupling to some degree, then we're probably going to do it. I guess the sort of final question, obviously, uh, you know, I'm working at a British university, so uh, I want to really know where is Australia relevant for where we're heading? So a lot of people say, you know, Australia is two or three sort of years down the line and this is where the UK is heading. Um, I, I mean, I suspect that's partly true and partly not, but I would be interested to know whether you think there are areas of current approach to China and Australia that Britain should take, you know, kind of heed of. And there are areas that you say, look, just look at where we are and avoid this. Hmm. Well, on, on your last point there, um, you know, the difference in terms of our dependence on, on, on China is, is extremely large. I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but say our export dependence on China is about one third, 30%, more than 30% of our exports are in China. Um, don't quote me on this, but I think last time I looked for the UK economy, it's something like three or four percent of that order. Yeah. Right? So it's yeah. much smaller. Right? So therefore, it's not going to be such a cost to you uh, if you are if you separate and decouple uh, from China because you know your dependency is pretty low. Um, I think the UK is pretty much going to follow in Australia's footsteps. Certainly, the Johnson government showed every indication. The fact that Huawei now is fairly being put at arm's length, uh, and that's uh, sort of symbolic in a way of, of the thinking of the of the government about the China. China risk now is featuring much more prominently in political discussions, particularly the Conservative Party. Um, and what you'll find seeing now is that the democracies, the poor democracies, and you take the Five Eyes, who are linking essentially the Anglo sphere, it's used to be essentially an intelligence relationship, it's now expanding into the mini uh, alliance, if you like. So I think Johnson government is sort of committing to that under a lot of pressure from the back there. So I think that a lot of what's happened in Australia is going to be emulated in the UK, even though you're not as vulnerable uh, as we are to retaliation by China. I think that's um, a great point to end on, basically, that, um, you know, kind of uh, we, I suppose the thing we can learn from Australia is um, don't get too close to China. <laughs> But I mean, obviously, uh, Australia is now managing that. Um, so thank you very much. That was a, a, a really helpful overview. Um, the report by the Henrik Foundation uh, came out last month, New Cold War, De-Risking US-China Conflict. Um, and so that's online. And I'm very grateful to Alan for spending, uh, for, for spending time with us today and sharing his rich experience. Um, and uh, hopefully when the flights uh, sort of start again, then he can get over here and look at the... Uh, sort of post-Brexit paradise that we're creating on Earth. <laughs> but thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure, Kerry. Thank you very much for inviting me on. I look forward to having continued discussion with yeah. you in person when I get to London one day. Excellent, excellent. Okay, James, I think we are, um, we're good. Uh, was that okay? I mean, was the quality okay uh, for the filming and everything? Sorry, Sorry. just yeah. on mute. Yeah, that was all good. Uh, so, um, it tends to any any blips tend to actually be be worked out um, by Zoom. They kind of okay. patch them up in the cloud. So so. I think the idea is, Alan, um, this will sort of be edited, and in about a week it will come out, and um, we will, um, you know, kind of spread it with our connections here, and uh, you know, on social media and everything, and um, put a link. Presumably, we put a link to the Henrik Foundation too, and they they also sort of. Because uh, you're not doing this for the University of New South Wales, are you? You're doing it no, for the Henry. Not at all. It's for the Heinrich Foundation, yes. Yeah, okay, so right. If Berenice gets a, a link, she'll be happy. Yes, okay, so good. I'll, I'll make sure well, I share it. Thanks very much, and sorry for uh, being slightly late, but uh, it's very important. Great. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Okay. Excellent. All right.